this tonight as we worship you, Lord, and we look into your word. Have your way in our hearts. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
our lives will be laid down before you every day. For you are our King, you are holy. And your name is the name of our all names. things in it that you know, a lot of people don't agree with, and tonight is going to be one of those that people, but it, let me tell you something, it's not my opinion, it's God's word. He says it. You've got a problem with it? You go to him. Don't come blame me. <laughs> Lord Jesus, this is your word. We ask you to speak to us. Holy Spirit, minister to our hearts this evening. And have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, verse 14, Genesis chapter 3. They have fallen. They blamed each other. And then the Lord God said to the serpent, the serpent who had deceived Eve, he says, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. As I read this, it tells me that the serpent snakes walked uprightly before this. I don't know if they had little feet or something. I don't know what they did, you know. But not any longer, on your belly you will go to the snake, to the serpent. Even during the time when this world is restored, they'll still be on their belly. 
crawling during the millennium. Isaiah 65, 25, speaking of that time, the 1,000 year millennium, when Jesus comes back and reigns on this earth and we come back with him. This is a prophecy about that time. It says there in Isaiah 65, 25, the wolf and the lamb will graze together and the lion will eat straw like the ox and dust will be the serpent's food. They will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. And so you see there that the dust will be the serpent's food because he's still crawling. It's like everything goes back to the original condition like in the Garden of Eden except for the serpent. Now, verse 15. We're going to see why the world now is the way it is. Why there's sin to it. Why there's so much. I mean, it's just. The world is cursed because of the fall of man. The world gets cursed too. Creation gets cursed. The animals, the plant, everything it, because of our sin, the world is cursed. So it says in verse 15, he's still speaking to the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. There's a couple of things here. This is a prophetic verse talking about Jesus and the virgin birth right here. In chapter 3 of Genesis, we have the gospel of Jesus Christ coming forth already. Prophetic. A third of this book is prophetic. God's word. A third of it is prophetic. And this is one of those. You see, there are a couple things in this. When a relationship is based on sin, people can't stand each other after a while. And enmity here is, is enmity means hatred. I will put enmity between you and the woman. She is going to hate you. She is not going to like snakes. How many women like snakes? You guys like snakes? I don't like snakes. We get lives of people who are not right before God and how when they turn on each other and how mean they can get and hating each other when their lives are based on sin. But right after sin, right after the bad news, comes the good news. God never leaves us there, does he? The good news. He says this. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. If you don't know it, a woman does not have a seed. The seed comes from the man. A woman doesn't have a seed. What is he saying here? You are going to have a supernatural birth. You are going to have, you're going to have a birth, you're going to be a virgin and have a birth. You're going to have a baby and be a virgin. Right here, verse 15 of chapter 3. And people say, well, man, we'll go by the Yeah, we couldn't even think of things like that. This was written so long ago. So who is that that was conceived supernaturally? Jesus. Jesus Christ. The virgin birth. And it says there that he will bruise you on the head. Satan, he's going to bruise you on the head. That means it's going to be a blow to death. He's gonna, it's a knockout punch. He's going to take you out. The offspring of the woman is going to crush the head of the devil. But the dragon, the devil, will bruise his heel. He's going to have a wound, but it's not going to be unto death. And what is that wound? Jesus Christ, crucified on the cross. But he came back to life. Bruise his heel, but a blow not to death. Jesus rose again. So you, you have it right here. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Incredible. Now he's going to go on. Because of Adam and Eve and their sin. There's, there's not punishment. There's consequences of their sin. So in verse 16. He says to the woman. He said. I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. 
Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. This is the controversial verse. Right here. Woman, you're going to have kids, but it's not going to be painless. It, there's going to be some pain involved in having children. And, you know, all the women I know that had kids, it didn't look like they were having a lot of joy to the birth. I remember our, yeah, I remember our friend when she was having her first kid. And, and she was, you know, she was, a, she was very low tolerant of pain. Like Anakin had a lot of pain and stuff. Sometimes you, she could be really sick and you wouldn't even know it. I mean, that's true. But this woman, she was a baby. And here she's having a baby. We're there with her, you know, and I, I wasn't in, in the birth room with her. I was outside, and Anna was with her, helping her have the baby. And her brother-in-law was sitting out there with me. And you know, she'd go, she'd scream. You know, and, and you know, and you know how it was, you know, because the labor pains, you know, they'd be first far apart, so the scream would be a little bit, and then it'd be a little quicker, and there'd be more screams. And then she's she's really screaming and grunting, groaning, whatever she's doing. And, and we're a good distance away, and it's sounding bad. And then she had this horrendous. <laughs> and her brother-in-law and I look at us, he doesn't go, that's a baby. <laughs> that's what she had the baby. Pain in childbirth. Because of the sin, our sin. That's that, huh? I, mean, I, you know, I guess it was going to be easier than that before. I mean, Adam would be just like, kabloop, kabloop, you know, just pop them out. Right? And, and some women do that. You know, some women go, kabloop. They have a little pain, but kabloop. Did you have kaboopers? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, ladies, that's because of the fall in the garden. And you can't blame Adam and Eve, it's our sin. Our sin, all of us. But he also says this, he, he says this interesting statement here. You, yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now this verse causes some puzzlement because it seems like, you know, these, having a desire for a husband would be a good thing, right? Uh, and not a curse. But in the Hebrew here, this phrase in, in question, it's, it includes a, a verb which is, Translate, toward your husband, your desire. And since this judgment is kind of predicted what's going to happen, uh, the future tense verb is will be. So in, in, in clarity, it's like this. Your desire will be for your husband. And, and really the most basic and straightforward forward definition or understanding of this is that the woman would now have, and the man would have an ongoing conflict. They were going to have a power struggle for the leadership in the home. There's going to be a power struggle. That, that's what this verse is talking about here. A power struggle. The, the harmony that between Adam and Eve and their relationship, from that point on, there's going to be some bumping the heads in there. And so God is saying that Eve would desire to, would, God is saying here, Eve would desire to rule over her husband but he would rule over her instead. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm going to continue on this. And, and so, it's not like you're a slave and those men are like, okay, woman. You know, it's not that kind of thing. Okay? We're, we're gonna look at this. So, don't run, out, don't run out the door, ladies. So, sin had brought problems. And one of them is the battle of the sexes had begun, right? Looking for that upper hand in the marriage. Now, the man who, you know, lovingly cared for his wife and the two of them were in love in the garden of Eden. I mean, you know, no problems at all. Now, he was going to seek to rule over her. He was going to change a bit. He was going to want to rule over her. And she was one of, going to want to take control over her husband. Now, it's important on this to remember this. That this judgment only states what will take place. God's saying that man and woman will live in conflict and the relationship will have some problems in it. But God, that's not God's way. 
you know, this isn't God causing this and this is not God's way. This is the curse from the fall. In the New Testament, God really affirms the ideal relationship between a man and a woman in marriage. The ideal relationship in the world, the way it is today. So the curse of sin cre created this garbage. But believers in Christ are called to live correctly God's way. Not the way of the sin that came into the world. So the wife should willingly submit to the man's leadership in the home. And the man should lay his life down for his wife. Completely. 100%. Husbands are to love their wives unconditionally and sacrificially just as Christ loves the church. It's in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 30. The scriptures there talk about this. But before you get to verse 22 and that, and you look at it, and most of us know the scriptures, it says this. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So number one, we are to submit to one another out of our reverence for the Lord because we love the Lord. That means men and women, husband and wife, submit to one another. It's, it's a two-way street in God's kingdom. That's how the passage starts. You see, from the beginning, God's focus has been on love between a man and a woman. Between a husband and a wife, I should say, not just a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, okay? And sin, you know, kind of messed that all up. But God wants the world to see a picture of Jesus Christ and his bride, who is the church. A born again believer in Jesus Christ, whether you're a man or a woman, you are the bride of Christ. And Jesus laid his life down for us unto death. And we as the bride, well, we, we submit to him and we honor him and we, we, we love him. That's the picture God wants for a man or a woman in their relationship as a husband and a wife. It's not a bad thing. It's not a man lording over the woman. Get in line, woman. So, you know, that's, that's not what the scriptures say at all. You know, really, when, when I look at it, from a uh, from a fleshly, worldly point of view, the man has the harder job. Die for your wife. All you get to do is honor the guy. You don't even have. You don't even say you have to love him, does it? Because we're supposed to love one another. But you know what I'm saying? Because you love her, guys. And if we do that as men, we don't have any trouble in the household. And I believe, in all situations, that when things are going in the house, the man and the woman talk it out and, and work it out together and try to come to a, a solution together. But if they really can't come to that solution together, God's way is that the man would make the final decision. That's what it's saying. It's just a position thing. It's not one better than the other or equal, less equal or anything. That's just the way it, it is. And it's not bad. If you think it's bad, then you better really seek the Lord and talk to the Lord and get his and find his heart out on this. Here's my thought. The man is to be the head and the woman is to be the heart. And you know, it's kind of, you know, when you look, I look at my relationship with my wife and I look at a Many people that I know, and I see that. You know, I'm the one, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I'm figuring it all out. Man. And that is sensitive to the things of spirit and loving and caring. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we're different. We're made differently. We're made differently. Look at little kids, boys and girls. I mean, I, I remember my niece. We go, I take my nephews to the toy store, man, they're right over to the guns and whatever is bad, right? You know, they just, you know, oh boy, oh boy. 
But I take my niece to the toy store. She wants to go to the clothing store and look at clothes. I'm telling you, she's three years old. She wasn't interested in toys. She wanted to look at clothes. Pretty, pretty. I didn't know any of my nephews ever did that. They didn't care what they looked like. Matter of fact, I tried to get them in the shower. You know? <laughs> We're made differently. It's just the way it is. And it's good. I'm sure you girls don't want to be a guy, and I don't want to be a girl. So let's do it God's way. But enough on that one. I, when I, leave, I have a uh, full study on that in Ephesians. Uh, it's on YouTube. You can go there and look at it. And, and the, the, it's that study of the scriptures I just read. But that's God's word. The problem is, is that, and even in Ephesians there, there I go, right? Men and women try to try to make their partner do the part that they, they, they make them try to do their part. You're supposed to love me like Jesus. Well, you're supposed to submit. You know what I mean? No, no, no. It's not our job to do that. My job is to be, try to be like Jesus. And your job is to do your part. And it's not my place to say, submit, woman. No, because that's not what it's saying. It's not my job. And it's not that kind of submission anyhow. It's an honoring. It's, it's honoring the husband as the head of the house. Well, he says that to the woman right there. So guys, don't look at that and say, "Who? Oh, he will rule over you. Ha-ha, oh, you know? It's not for you guys. The next part's for us. Verse 17 in Genesis chapter 3. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I have commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. He's getting, this is called in the shed getting a lashing here. Hey, you, she was deceived, Adam. You knew better. And it's like that kind of thing, right? Then he says, because of that, Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. The ground is cursed because of Adam, because of our sin. The world has fallen also. Not just Adam and Eve, but the whole world. I, I believe that in the Garden of Eden, there, grass didn't, I don't think grass turned brown. There was no death. So there was no brown. You know, everything was green and blue and colors like they're supposed to be. No thistles and thorns. And now you've got this thing enter, entered into the world because of sin. It's spelled like this. W-O-R-K Work Like Maynard G. Krebs, remember him? Work! You know, those of you who know 1950s show, okay? Most of you running around Anytime somebody would say the word You go, work! Work! You know, because he was allergic to it he Introduced into the world You are, man You are no longer going to have it made in the shade You're going to have to work until you die Here's how it is. Man, you're going to go to work. It's going to keep you out of trouble, too. If you're out there working, it's going to keep you out of trouble. If you get too much time in your hand, you have too much time in your hand, it's trouble. Look at look at our village. And you can see those who are busy doing things. You see those who don't, who, who don't have things to do and they're not working. Trouble. But all over the world, not the same, I just use it because we live here. It's the way it is. That women, that's why your man is so busy. And they're a lot of times they're workaholics because of the curse. I have to provide for my family. I've got to do it. Staying busy. And, and this can be a problem. It can be a problem. She wants to talk, and he's ready to go. You know, I, I catch that in myself with my wife. 
you know, I'm studying in the office, you know, and preparing for the messages or whatever I'm doing in there, my, the, the, the things that I do, and she'll come in and, you know, oh, and she wants to say some things, and I'm, and I'm like this, oh yeah, oh, well, you know, and I realize, you know, I, I need to give her the time. I need to stop what I'm doing to give her the time. I have to, I have to make myself do that because my natural thing is just to, oh, okay, okay. And then she leaves and then I, what did she say? You know? It could be a problem. She wants to enjoy and he wants things to happen. It's part of the curse. And you can seek to change him all you want and you're not going to. Any of you had your men for a while? You know that already. And if you've been seeking to change him, you've probably made him into a... I want to word this properly. Not a coward, but a withdrawn man. And a henpecked hen man that a woman tries to change withdraws, just goes into his own world, doesn't deal with anything, doesn't take leadership of the family, doesn't do things. Because, you know, don't try to change him. If you think he needs to change, you go to God. You, you go to the Lord. Amen. Tell God on him. Because the more you try to change him, the more he's going to put that up. And he's going to put that wall up. And you're not going to get through. And the walls are going to get so tall, you're never going to get over it. So when we realize that that's part of the curse and, and, and the relationship of a man and woman as we see in these two verses here, or these, these two verses here, is part of the curse, it should give us a, more of an understanding and lower our standard a little bit of what of our expectations and really not have any expectations. But give our spouses to the Lord. She's yours, Lord. You deal with her. He's yours, Lord. Crush him. <laughs> Conk him on the head. You know, we need to get conked. That's why I said it. Not crush him. Conk him. As soon as we realize this, as soon as we realize that the other person cannot meet our needs, the better off we'll be. Well, then who's going to meet my needs? Who can? Jesus. Jesus is the one who meets our needs. We go to the Lord. He is all that we need. And He's blessed us with maybe someone in our lives. Surrender them to the Lord and get your needs met from Jesus. And when you do that, you're not going to have all these expectations and all these trips laid on each other. He cares about you. Jesus cares about your feelings, ladies. He cares about your feelings. He's compassionate. And you know, and when the men start taking that role in, in their life and become like Jesus, guess what? They become a little more compassionate too. I am so much more compassionate than I was 40, 50 years ago. I didn't even know if I had compassion 40, 50 years ago. 40, 50 years ago, I would have kicked the cat out the door. And now I feel sorry for it. You know, I'm, what happened? I don't know. I mean, I'm just talking about cat, but I mean, for people and things. God has given me compassion I never had before. It's His compassion. And you can let the Lord do what He does good. You know, I, I tell, tell you the truth, I can't hardly even stand it anymore, the compassion that He's given me. Because it, it, it's something that make, it, it bums me out because I, because Sometimes there's nothing you can do. Your heart's breaking for someone. There's nothing you can do but pray. I don't like that. I don't, I don't you know, I remember when I didn't have that. I don't have to deal with those feelings of hurting for people like that. I really don't like it. But I can't help it. I even cried more times than I ever, I know I never cried earlier in life. No, 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 no. Yeah. I'll, I'll watch these chick flicks. Is that what you call them? Am I, 
that on tape? Am I going to be fried because I said that? Am I going to whatever it is? Huh? It is on tape. Yeah. Uh, what should I call them? You're good. Sentimental movies <laughs> that my wife likes. And you know, I can't get her to watch you know, movies with me, so you know, I'll watch because she can't stand them. So, you know, I'll watch her movies with her. Oh, my, God. my goodness, you know, I watched that, that movie, uh, Jeffrey Camp's, Jeremy Camp's story. I still believe, my goodness, I, I, I can't watch that thing, man. I go, all right, when the park, when I, towards the end of it, I can walk out. I'm not going to walk. I am not crying again. <laughs> You know, we watched it with somebody one time, and they didn't even blink an eye. And I thought, I said, I asked them, what's the matter with you? <laughs> I mean, doesn't that just break your heart? God can give you compassion, ladies. They're your men, compassion. Pray for them. And men... One of our jobs is to make sure that we let our wives and our children know that our satisfaction comes from Jesus. It comes from the Lord. And when they see that, that will bless them. And you know, and that doesn't mean we're not satisfied with them, but when it comes from the Lord, we're not going to be nitpicky and grumpy and, you know, well, we might be grumpy because we wake up like this in my life. You know what I mean? You're not going to pick on them. Because God is going to fulfill us. So man, don't worry about the sweat. Don't worry about all the thorns that pop up. That's the way it is. Just keep on cleaning the yard. Keep on doing it. It's going to keep on growing. And don't be anxious. Let the Lord have his way in your life. You know, I, I love the scripture in Matthew chapter 6. The cure for anxiety. Why don't you go ahead and turn there. Matthew 6 verse 25. You guys know I love it. Those who have been around enough, you've probably heard it from me 50 times. At least Kerwin has. Because this is what the Lord says to us. This is to you and I. Yes, he's speaking to his disciples, but it's to you and I. He says in verse 25, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They, don't have, they do not sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they. And who of you by being worried can add a single hour to his life? Let that one sink in your brain. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God clothes the, clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow was thrown into the furnace, Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. But your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble. Of its own. Amen. 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 I I love that scripture. Everybody should know that scripture. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all those things will be added to you. What things? The things you just talked about. Your food, your clothing, where you live. But you seek him first. You seek the Lord. Amen. When two people look to Jesus for their lives, the bickering stops and there'll be peace in the family. We need to die to ourselves, love each other, 
listen to each other, take care of each other, just like Jesus loved the church. And, and women, it's really not that man that you're submitting to. You know, it really isn't. You know who you're really submitted to? You're submitting to Jesus. And that's the way you can look at it. I'm submitting to you, Lord. <laughs> and, and I'm letting you submit. I'm submitting to my husband. You're doing it through me. Because sometimes it can be very difficult. Some men are unreasonable. I have been unreasonable in my life. And when I learned what submission was, I broke my heart that I had been unreasonable towards my wife. So you just hang in there. There's hope. I think Anna and I made it. If we made it, you can make it. Just remember, keep your expectations low. You won't be disappointed. Because it's all part of the curse. All right, now back. Let's finish up Genesis chapter 3 verse 20 then says, Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Before that, she was woman. Whoa, man. Wow, man. You know what I mean? The, they saw her. I imagine, ladies, that Adam and Eve were tens. They were probably twenties on a scale of one to ten, right? They were perfect. We'd all... We saw them guard the girls to see the see Adam and Eve. Wow. You know, the guys see Eve and go, wow. So he said, wow, man. Now it means the giver of life, Eve. See, I think he understands something here. He understands what God said in this chapter. He sees no longer woman, but God is going to give the giver of life. Through here, through her, through Jesus. She's going to be the giver of life because Jesus is going to be born to a woman. The giver of life. The Savior, the Messiah. He will come through her. <clears throat> now, not Eve, but her, you know, down the line. Her seed. Uh -huh. Because we can look to our wives, we can quit trying. To control them and be the boss. Because the Lord lives inside of her. And ladies, the Lord lives inside your man. So, let's treat each other like it. Eve, who is woman. Verse 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. The Lord God himself, right here, he kills the first animal to cover the sin of Adam and Eve. They tried to cover their sin with fig leaves, right? He had to kill an animal to cover their shame. I believe it was a lamb. I bet you it was a lamb. It doesn't say, but I bet you it was a lamb that's covering their nakedness. The first killing in creation, an innocent lamb. That's what I believe. You know, because we have a picture in the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus is called the Lamb of God. When, when John the Baptist on the one who takes the sin of the world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then you have the Lamb sacrificed for the sin in the Old Testament by the Jewish people. And then you have Jesus who clothes us and covers our sin with His righteousness. He did it for us. By His blood. I believe Adam and Eve will be in heaven because God covered their sin. Like I believe you will be in heaven because Jesus has covered your sin if you put your trust and faith in that. Okay? So verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. You know, don't, don't miss scriptures like that, okay? Because God says, the man has become like one of us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Trinity, that, it's right there. People say, well, where is the Trinity in the Bible? It's right there. God is saying, become a, one of us. You know, there's only one God, but he's in three persons, us. He's become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. You see, if, if Adam eats from that, the tree of life in the garden now, 
I don't, I don't, I guess what that means is, if he eats from it, he's going to be in that state forever. So God has to stop him from eating that tree while he's in his sin nature, or he'll be in it forever. That, that's what this is saying, okay? And then, so he continues there in verse 23. Therefore, the Lord God sent him from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turn every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So Adam, or you or I, no longer have access to the Garden of Eden. I, I believe it's still there, but it's guarded. You can't get to it. No one knows where it is. Just in case somebody would eat from that and get stuck in this. And it's guarded by a cherubim. And that, that's that winged angel. Where we see the cherubim in uh, Ezekiel 10 and Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 6. You can get the description of that angel in those pictures, in, in those scriptures. Very, very powerful uh, pictures of what the angel, that, that angel looks like in there. The cherubim. So that brings us to the end of chapter 3. And next week we're going to Actually, next week, I'm not sure what's going to happen. We might have a pastor guy might be sure with this. Maybe not. Uh, if not, we'll be in chapter 4 in Cain and Abel. Sad, sad story. But now we can see why the world is the way it is today. It's called the curse. And Jesus came and he died for us so that we don't have to live with the curse in our lives anymore. Yeah, we, we have, we're still suffering the consequences of it. The world is still the way it is. But Jesus is going to come back and make things right. The thousand year millennium is going to be this incredible world like we've never known. But like it was before there was sin. And everybody's going to get along and animals aren't going to be afraid of us anymore. It's going to be an incredible time on this earth. I'm so looking forward to that. But I'm looking forward to being with Jesus first. So, Father, Lord, God, Jesus, we thank you once again for your word. Everything in this world and everything in life is in the Bible, Lord. And when you see the beginnings of things in Genesis, the beginning of sin, the beginning of the fallen state of this earth, and the beginning of work and problems and marriages and all, all those things were right here that we're looking at. And thank you, Lord, for showing us and teaching us so we have more of an understanding of what, what things are all about and, the, and this world is this cursed condition. And Lord, because of that, we don't have to have expectations on one another, not just family and husbands and wives and children, but everyone, Lord, not to have that expectation but just be able to share the good news with those we come in contact with so that they may know you and go and be with you and I, Lord, in eternity forever. Use us, Lord. Help us to love one another. I pray for men, Lord, that we would be like Jesus in our relationship with our wives. And I pray for the women, Lord, that they would be like the bride of Christ in the relationship. And that picture would go forth in this world it would draw people to you, Jesus, because they'd see how things could really be in peace and harmony. So Lord, we give it all to you. We thank you. Even now, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Go before us and use us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys. God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord.